Porsche is celebrating the 20th anniversary of its Boxster series. To mark the occasion, it's renamed the latest generation, the 718 Boxster. Inside and out, just cosmetic changes have been made. Only the engine is a real novelty. A newly developed turbocharged four-cylinder replaces the previous V6. Our car tester Klaus Nietzwitz is in Portugal taking the new Boxster for a spin. He says the sports car was first launched 20 years ago and that the latest model has undergone some minor changes. A redesigned exterior, new suspension and engine. Some might be disappointed that the engine has been downgraded from six cylinders to four, but the Boxster S has 350 horsepower and remains an enjoyable ride. Despite the car's smaller engine, it produces 35 horsepower and 60 newton meters more torque than the previous model. The open top two-seater is more powerful, efficient, and lighter than its predecessor. The double-clutch transmission allows it to accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.4 seconds. The Boxster has a maximum speed of 285 kilometers per hour. Porsche says fuel consumption is just 7.3 liters per 100 kilometers. In Germany, the Boxster S model sells for around 69,000 euros. Klaus says the Porsche suspension was overhauled and is now somewhat stiffer, which improves the car's handling. More ambitious drivers can opt for Porsche's PASM suspension. It lowers the Boxster by 20 millimeters, and when you select the Sport Plus option, the suspension is even stiffer, and the Porsche really hugs the curve. Using this paddle, the driver can switch gears, and this new dial on the steering wheel allows drivers to choose between different driving modes. So much for the country road, says Klaus. So far, the car's been a blast. Great handling, excellent traction, brilliant acceleration. Now it's time to try out the Porsche on a test track. To test the car's limits. On the slalom course, Porsche instructor Matthias Hofstrommer demonstrates the effects of the new steering system, which is 10% more direct than before. Matthias notes that despite jerky steering movements, the car remains on track. Even when pushed to the limit, the Boxster remains a stable ride. Even changing lanes at 110 kilometers per hour and oversteering slightly is no problem for the Porsche. Back onto the country road. So how does Klaus rate the new Boxster S overall? Klaus thinks Porsche has lived up to its reputation again. Even though the new Porsche only has a four-cylinder engine, it's still a genuine sports car. As our tester Matas Kurat explains, the future of the car lies not only with automakers, but also with their suppliers. Interesting concepts are put forward to the manufacturer, who can say, yes, that works for us, or no, it doesn't. Matas is standing beside the Advanced Urban Vehicle, a car from ZF Group, with many new components. To find out more, Matas has traveled to Friedrichshafen to meet someone who knows all about it. Gefahren an den schönen Bodensee und treffe mich mit jemandem, der wirklich Ahnung von diesem Auto hat. Hallo, Herr Gumpolsberger. The man in question, Gerhard Gumpolsberger, who helped develop the car. After a quick meet and greet, Matas is keen to hit the road and see what it has to offer. The advanced urban vehicle was built by ZF to demonstrate several different innovations at once to potential industry clients. 
One special feature is the steering angle of up to 75 degrees, allowing a turning circle diameter of just six and a half meters. Montes wonders if cars with such wide steering angles suddenly appear on the road, won't people drive in the wrong direction because they're not used to it? But Gerhard sees no cause for concern. The car is very normal to drive, but it does mean you can maneuver the car extra precisely when parking. So he hopes the steering will actually prevent bumps while maneuvering. Monta suggests it'll also stop you accidentally ramming into the person in front when parallel parking. A compact car provided the basis for the advanced urban vehicle, but now the two have very little left in common. When Montes asked what has changed, Gerhard explains that he and his colleagues pretty much rebuilt the car from scratch. They took the bodywork and installed a new purely electric rear axle. Because there's no combustion engine at the front, they had space to play with, so that made way for the new steering system. Then they needed to install the right batteries and sensors to allow for autonomous driving. He also describes a new function they've developed called Pre-Vision Cloud Assist. It sends data collected in the car to a cloud, which can be used to increase the driver's efficiency. For example, if you do the same journey every day, you know how fast you can take each corner. But better still, you can find out how fast other drivers take the same corners. So if you're not paying attention one day, or the weather's bad and you shouldn't be driving so fast, the car could alert you or even brake for you automatically. This little car is brimming with new technology. And out on the test track, everything's working just as it should. In fact, it looks ready to hit the production lines. So, asked Matis, if a manufacturer came to you and said, yes, that's exactly what we want, could ZF come back and say, great, we'll deliver it tomorrow? Gerhard says that sadly it's not as easy as that because the parts they've installed here are prototypes. These are their first attempts, so to go into production would require a lot more development time. However, if a manufacturer came to ZF now, then they could start on this development with them right away. It will take another three to five years at least before much of the technology from the prototype will make it into series production vehicles. Monta says, as the name suggests, the advanced urban vehicle is intended for use in the city. And here, unless you're a cabbie, you don't want to just drive around all the time. You want to go somewhere, shopping, to work, or maybe to the movies. Which, of course, means that you'll need to park your car, too. Mata says he can park the advanced urban vehicle using this remote app on his smartwatch. The car looks for a parking space on its own. Now that it's found one, it'll go into reverse and back into the parking spot. It's helped by the huge steering angle at the front, as well as by ZF's Smart Parking Assist, which employs 14 sensors to ensure that the car doesn't hit anything while parking. Monta says the control electronics use the sensors to park the car autonomously. There, it's parked. And when you're done, you can use your smartwatch to drive the car out of the parking spot. Or you can just get in, turn the wheel and drive out again. This might look familiar. It's the VW Charan. And the car in tow? No, that's not just the same model in black. That's the Seat Alhambra. Both are based on the same platform. And both are manufactured in Portugal. 
So it begs the question, why does the entry-level Chirag cost around 2,300 euros more than the Seat? Both have the same outer measurements, and both can be upgraded to seven-seater models, but at significantly different costs. Adding a third row of seats to the Chiron will set you back an extra 2,000 euros, our car tester Andrei Zimmermann explains, but under 1,000 euros in the Alhambra. What's the reason? Well, adding the extra seats in the Chiron automatically adds temperature control to your second row of seats. So you can buy that as an add-on for the Alhambra, he says. It's not mandatory, though, so you can save money there. But in Andre's Alhambra FR model, it does come as standard. He's going to take a front row seat now and check out the interior from there. If you ask me, says Andre, it's a typical Seat, smart and sporty. He points out the soft materials at the top and black stripes, which he finds very stylish. But down here, well, therein lies the price difference, Andre reckons. Now let's go give the Chiran a once-over. Often price differences within the VW group are based on the look and feel of the interior and the materials used there. Andre can't really find any major differences apart from the steering wheels. The Chiran has this wood effect, but Andre is not a fan. He finds it very old-fashioned. Moving on to the materials, the top is soft, just like the Alhambra. But... Oh, <laughs> the transmission tunnel is hard plastic. He wouldn't have expected that with the price difference. He thought VW would have made a bit more effort here. But hey, what can you do? Let's take her for a spin. Our test car has the top spec equipment, VW's Highline package. It has a 2-liter diesel engine and puts out 110 kilowatts of power. That'll get you to 100 kilometers an hour in just 10 seconds. So far, Andre's driving experience in the Chiran has been impeccable. Sure, it's a two-ton car, but he says the 100-kilowatt diesel engine handles it well. The transmission is also fine so far, but something the Seat doesn't have is adaptive chassis control, meaning you can't adjust the suspension. Here, he can choose from normal, sport, and comfort modes and he can really tell the difference. In sport mode, you feel more of the road, while in comfort mode, you get more of a floaty drive, but safe nonetheless. Andre reckons he'd be better off saving the money, though. Adding the third row of seats and automatic sliding doors takes the VW to just under 44,400 euros in Germany. But a Seat Alhambra FR with the same kit will run you around 41,200 euros in Germany, a good 3,000 less. Does this huge price difference really tally with the overall driving experience? Andre can't pinpoint any great differences in the drive of the two cars. Although the Alhambra FR line has a sporty chassis as standard, he thinks it's also comfortable enough for long trips. And subjectively, he thinks the Alhambra feels zippier during acceleration. So all in all, who comes out on top in this heavyweight battle? As Andre says, there can only be one winner, and it's the Seat Alhambra. He finds it the sleeker, sportier of the two, and it's cheaper in terms of the starting price and the add-ons than its VW competitor. Our car tester Michel Asenmacher knows from experience that a flat tire can ruin your day. You'll often need a car jack 
and a bunch of other tools. But Bridgestone's new drive guard tire is an exception. The manufacturer guarantees drivers can still safely drive for up to 80 kilometers after a puncture. An expert from Bridgestone explains how this is possible. Sebastian Grimm says a flat car tire is like a deflated space hopper for children. If there's no air inside it, it's not going to work. The previous generations of run-flat tires were customized to suit different cars. Now drive guard tires fit all car models. Michelle says she needs to get a feeling for a damaged and an undamaged tire so she can compare the two. She starts with a good tire. The run-flat tires have reinforced sidewall supports, proving extra protection if the tire is damaged. In the past, these supports made the tires harder, which made for a less comfortable ride overall. So manufacturers would customize their vehicles to suit these tires by adjusting the suspension. Michelle says she's had enough time to get a feeling for the car with tires intact. Now it's time to puncture the front left drive guard tire with a nail to see how it holds up. Michelle is safe and ready. Time to puncture the tire. And she drives the nail right into the tire. Schön drin. Then removes it. <laughs> With old tires, this sound usually meant that a tire change was necessary, which can be very dangerous if done on the roadside and very time consuming, especially if you're inexperienced. To see just how long it takes, our car tester changed the tire using only the tools provided by the manufacturer. It took a grand total of 12 minutes. And now back to the punctured run-flat tire. The tire has cooling fins on the sides. This allowed Bridgestone to reduce the thickness of the tire's inside wall, giving the car smoother handling as well as extra security. The drive guard tire can be fitted onto any vehicle that has a tire pressure monitoring system. Only this noise indicates that the tire is actually flat. Michelle says it's a totally new experience using run-flat tires. They allow for much better handling and control compared to flat tires she's had on her own car. It's important to remember that the tire is designed for emergencies only and not intended to last forever. After 80 kilometers, it should be replaced with a new tire. This gives you plenty of time to find somewhere safe to do so. Changing tires is not only hard work, but it can also be dangerous when done on the roadside. So these run-flat tires are also a step towards greater road safety, says Michelle. No tires are immune from punctures. But at least the run-flat tire can get you to a place where you can fit the new tire in safely. Time now for a trip back in time as Christoph Bauer puts a rare classic from the 1950s through its paces. In 1924, Friedrich Romich set up shop in Berlin as a custom coach builder for well-heeled customers. The post-World War II era saw a range of convertibles, four-door taxis, and other models based on the platform of the VW Beetle. A 
Christoph says in 1957, Romech promised drivers that they would like this new model, the Lawrence, named after its designer, Bert Lawrence. And they liked it big time, as its design mirrored the American styling so popular at the time. But underneath this beautiful exterior is the VW Beetle's dependable mass production technology. Unlike modern cars, the Beetle did not employ unibody construction. So once you remove the Beetle shell, other bodies could easily be fitted onto the floor pan. In 1950, Romech presented the Bisco, his first model based on the Beetle. Throughout 1957, his company turned out 280 units of the hand-built special edition, a sensational success. However, in 1955, Volkswagen had brought out its own sporty Beetle derivative and was keen to see it succeed. The Carmen Ghia by Volkswagen. Christoph says after VW launched the Carmen Ghia, its own sports car based on the Beetle, they tried to make life difficult for even the smallest competitor, including Romech. Volkswagen stopped supplying him with separate chassis. Having to buy complete models was far more expensive, and dismantling them was hard work. Eventually, VW stopped selling him cars altogether. Romech had to resort to middlemen and the black market to get the Beetles he needed. Volkswagen was simply too big to challenge. In just the first year, VW made 10,000 Carmen Ghias, while four years' production of the Lawrence amounted to just 85 units. No wonder crafting each individual car required 1,200 man hours of labor. Romech succeeded in making a car as beautiful on the inside as the outside, says Christoph. The luxurious interior boasts separately adjustable seats and standard fitted hot air heating with a window defroster. And it has a padded dashboard, a standard safety feature today, but a real innovation back then. The body parts are all made from lightweight aluminum and sit on a frame of wood and metal. The shape of the body reflects the American way of life that was catching on in Europe. So this upgraded Beetle from Berlin came with a panoramic windshield and tail fins. Though the lovely looking Lawrence nonetheless remained a European. Everything was a little more elegant and delicate than the chunkier American models. The slick two-tone paint job underlines the graceful Italian style contouring and customers could order a color combination of their choice. Designer Bert Lawrence was a furniture maker by trade. This beauty would be the only car he ever created as a favor to Friedrich Romech. Inside it came fully loaded with a Petri steering wheel and details that gave it the aura of a luxury model. The Romich Lawrence sits 15 centimeters lower than the VW Beetle, which Christoph feels gives it a look that's very sporty and dynamic. Unfortunately, it doesn't feel that way to drive, and it's fitted with a standard Beetle engine which barely generates 30 horsepower. This car has been customized with two Solex 32 carburetors that up the output to 40 horsepower, which Christoph thinks is okay. The souped-up 1.2-liter engine lets the car hit a top speed of 135 kilometers an hour, 25 more than a standard Beetle. Christoph says that the Romech Lawrence was the last German car to combine an individually made alloy body with reliable series production technology, so it's definitely a milestone in automotive history. The Romech Lawrence is a relic from the good old days when cars were handcrafted and manual labor was still affordable. Today, the 1,200 hours it took to produce a single vehicle would translate to over 100,000 euros in labor costs alone. Mm -hmm.